if you'll join us in the hymnals or the words on the screen, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Sing out. sing some songs together to the Lord. This is who you say I am.
small in number today. Your voices sound beautiful. Good morning, church. Today we're going to do a quick reading. Matthew 28, 5 to 6. But the, the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come to the place where the Lord lay.
Well, I've enjoyed the service so far. Mr. Britton, thank you for the, the music. Jared, for the prayer. Alexis, Michelle, for the Bible reading. Elaine, at the camera there. Now, if we're being honest, completely honest with each other today, we're going to have to admit that we're pretending. Somebody is. I'm not talking about being a Christian. I'm just talking about pretending to want to be in this room this morning and not out there inside, outside in that weather. So I don't know if anybody wants to be out there. I, I kind of resonate with that idea myself. I see Mike. He's, he's nodding his head. Is there a bike ride in your future, Mike? If it doesn't rain, fair enough. And, um, you know, with this desire to get outside, I want you to know I, I know, I care, I understand. And it can be hard to get ourselves to church some Sabbaths, but we, we keep a goal in mind, trusting that God has a blessing for us if we come here and uh, worship together. That leads me to my message this morning. Reaching forward, we're going to be looking a little bit at one of Paul's letters. He wrote a letter to the Philippians while he was in prison in Rome. Well, he was under house arrest in Rome. And I'm going to be looking at chapter 3. For those who like to follow along, that's who we'll be. Mostly focused on, I think, verses 7 through 15, but we'll be starting in verse 4 roughly. This won't be a deep Bible study, don't worry. But we'll be touching over on these verses. Um, it shows what Paul was thinking, what's important, and talking about perseverance. In fact, these are the things that kind of stand out to me when I read through this section of Philippians. Knowing Jesus, God's also, which speaks to purpose, reaching forward for the prize. And we'll talk about that prize and God's care for us. So Paul argues in this bit of Philippians that knowing Jesus is the most important thing and nothing else matters by comparison. And Paul contrasts this idea of being saved by works of the flesh with being saved by faith. And in fact, he uses his own life as a an example, as it were, to make this contrast. Uh, he reflects on his time when he was known as Saul the Pharisee, or Saul of, um, I don't remember the other reference, but at that time he was known as Saul. And let's look into his story just a little bit. He was born in Turkey in a city called Tarsus. However, early in life, his family moved him to Jerusalem. So. I think we can assume that they probably perceived that he was a gifted young man and they wanted him to have access to the, the best teachers in Judaism. And in fact, he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, who was one of the preeminent teachers at that time. And he was taught according to the strictness of the law. So he grew up in the Jewish culture and in a strict version of the religion. And he was born into the tribe of Benjamin. So here Paul starts to get into some spiritual credentials or his spiritual inheritance, as it were. And he points out that he was born into the tribe of Benjamin, the significance being that the tribe of Benjamin was the only tribe that stayed with Judah in the southern kingdom when the, when the kingdom split after Solomon. And he reflects on the, another point of his spiritual inheritance. He was circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law, a thing I figure he probably doesn't personally remember, but it was so significant that his parents probably told him about it and made sure he knew that he had this legacy in his life. So he grew up in Jewish culture and in a strict version of the religion, but he didn't stop there. He made a choice for himself. He became a Pharisee, and he said that he kept the law perfectly. And as a Pharisee, he would have been in a position of wealth and power, and we can assume from the story of Paul's life that he had friends in Jewish leadership. And he was so zealous for the law 
that toward his time, toward the end of his time as Saul the Pharisee, he was persecuting the Christians. And what does Paul say about all this? Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, he says, But these assets I have come to regard as liabilities. This is the New English translation. More than that, I now regard all things as liabilities compared to the far greater value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. His point. If we put our trust in anything other than Jesus, our assets can become liabilities. An asset is something with value. And a liability is a debt or something that holds one back. And Paul's point here is that his spiritual inheritance, all the the worldly greatness that he attained to, was nothing compared to Jesus. Paul wrote, as we just read, I now regard all things as liabilities compared to the far greater value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. All these things can have their place in the life of a Christian. They can help us advance the cause of God's kingdom. But if any of these things is held in higher regard than knowing Jesus, then they become liabilities. All right, Paul moves on in his letter to reflect on his salvation experience. I got it as God's also. It's in the verse. We'll we'll get to that in a second. God called him to be saved, but there was an also, an additional purpose. And I want to share a story that speaks to purpose. There was a man named Benoit Lecomte. In 1998, Benoit was credited as being the first man to swim across the Atlantic Ocean without a kickboard. How did he do it? He swam from Massachusetts all the way to France, and it took him 73 days. So he didn't do it overnight. So that's why I would say, understandable now, Paul. 73 days, no problem. What happened is he had a sailboat that was traveling with him, a small crew on a 40-foot sailboat, and the sailboat served a couple purposes. One, it was emitting a, an electromagnetic field to keep the sharks away. And number two, Benoit would swim for a few hours, then he would get up on the sailboat, rest for a while, and then he'd go back to swimming. And this is how he was able to accomplish this feat. Along the way, he encountered some sea turtles, dolphins, and jellyfish. And for five days, he was followed by a great white shark. So what could have possibly motivated him to do this? I'll say that it was love, love for his father. You see, Benoit was engaging in this enterprise, in this adventure, for the sake of bringing attention to cancer cure research and to encourage people to sponsor cancer cure research. Why? Because his father had died some time before after a struggle with cancer. And so Benoit took it up on himself. He, brought, he took on this purpose to help other people avoid the terrible fate that his father had. We continue in Paul's letter. My aim is to know him. My aim is to know him, to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings, and to be like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this, that is, I have not already been perfected, but I strive to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. So he's coming off of his first point that he, the most important thing is to know Jesus. And he affirms, I want to know Jesus. And I want to, I attain to the resurrection of the dead. I want to live a life worthy of Christ. But I don't count myself to have been perfected. But I do this. I strive to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. And I know this is, this is kind of a uh, difficult sentence structure maybe, but the, ma- oops. the main point here is that Paul is saying that he's trying to take hold of something else. 
When Christ took hold of him, there was an also. There was something else that Christ was doing. There was some other purpose that Christ gave him, not just to save Paul. We can go back to his conversion experience to figure out what was this also. When Jesus was calling Paul, and we'll reflect on the, the story a little bit later, when he sent a man named Ananias to go talk to Paul, and he gave Ananias a message for Paul. And when Ananias was coming to the end of his talk with Paul, he said the following. He said, you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. So number one, God, Jesus called on Paul to be baptized. Have your sins washed away, calling on Jesus' name. So he wanted to save Paul. That's the number one. And the also, you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. This was Paul's also. This was the additional purpose that God gave him. And Paul accepted this new purpose. He accepted this purpose for his life and he was trying to take hold of it. Even here when he wrote this letter, he had been traveling around the Mediterranean for years, ministering, and he still claims to be trying to take hold of this, make it his purpose in life. And I believe God has an also for every person here. God has a purpose for us. When he saves us, he also gives us a part in his ministry of saving others. I got an amen? amen. Reaching forward. So if we continue in Paul's letter, we find him encouraging the reader to keep reaching forward. So I want to share with you the story of Ed Stafford and his journey traveling the Amazon River. Ed Stafford, uh, we'll get into what he did here in a second. Uh, much of what I'm going to read is taken from a book called A World of Wonders by Doug Batchelor uh, with some added details. So Ed's story starts with this. Someone said it could not be done, and Ed decided he was going to do it anyway. After leaving the military, the 34-year-old British Army captain became bored with office life. So when someone told him that no one had ever walked the entire length of the Amazon, he took it as a personal challenge, and he began his journey in April of 2008, leaving the Pacific Ocean in southern Peru. And he started his journey with a traveling companion named Luke Coyer. But Ed and Luke had a dispute after about three months into their journey, and Luke left him. And so Ed continued his journey alone. However, along the way, he ran into a man named Sanchez Rivera, who was a 31-year-old Peruvian forestry worker. So they continued on together. At first, when he started his journey, Ed guessed that his jungle adventure would take about a year to complete. But he soon realized that was wishful thinking. Each step of the 4,200 miles brought a new battle. Ed and Rivera contended with piranhas, giant anaconda snakes, whirlpools, flood currents, relentless rain, mosquitoes, and disease. They dodged an 18-foot crocodile at some point and endured many food shortages. They lived off of piranha and palm hearts with occasional stops for provisions at villages along the river. One of the biggest threats, though, was the territorial natives who had been abused and mistreated for decades. And the villagers were often distrustful and frequently violent. He also had some other issues along the way. At one point, Ed was accused of murder and was held for 48 hours. He also had a sponsor at the beginning of his journey, but somewhere in the middle, because of financial trouble, the sponsor pulled out. So he went from having 1,000 British pounds a month to nothing for his journey. As well, he had a GPS device with him, but that failed, and his insurance ran out, so that meant there could be no helicopter rescue if something happened. Nevertheless, for two and a half years, Ed relentlessly trudged 
swam and climbed along the river bank, often needing to hack his path one step at a time with a machete. Just one day shy of his destination, he was nearing the Atlantic. He collapsed at the side of the road, his body so, spread, so spent that he broke out into a whole body rash. However, after resting for a few hours, he was back on his feet, pressing on. 53 miles later, August 9, 2010, an exuberant Ed Stafford ran into the Atlantic Ocean in northern Brazil. He is the first person to walk the entire length of the Amazon River from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And I'm looking for volunteers today to go with me. No. Thinking about Ed's adventure, he had many opportunities to give up. Maybe when he was walking alone between his traveling companions before he met Rivera. He probably thought long and hard when his sponsor pulled out. And those many times when he ran out of food afterwards probably caused him to think deeply about what he was doing. But he kept going. Paul continues in his letter, brothers and sisters, I am single-minded, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching out for the things that are ahead. With this goal in mind, I strive toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And there are many things that can pull us back in our Christian journey. It's easy to look back and get hung up on things that have happened to us in the past, is it not? But Paul encourages us to put those things behind us, push forward in the Christian journey. And he mentions that prize. What is that prize? In Paul's adventures around the Mediterranean, he always had two things in mind. These two things, I believe, constituted the prize. Himself being saved, knowing Jesus, walking with Jesus, and the other was working for others, trying to work for others to be saved as well. You see, Paul was beaten more than once in his journeys. But something allowed him to get up and keep going. He was imprisoned multiple times. One time, he and Silas were being held in a dungeon. And yet, at midnight, they sang songs together. Even in the middle of such a terrible experience, he continued praising God. And when he was shipwrecked as a prisoner on the way to Rome, something kept his spirits up. What was it that kept him going? He was always reaching forward for the prize. So I want to do just a little Bible study here, not too deep, pulling these two ideas together, Paul and other people. Because in four places, he pulls these two ideas together. Paul himself puts these two ideas together. This, this is from the, uh, when Ananias was talking to him. And we read it earlier. So Ananias said, get up, be baptized, have your sins washed away, calling on his name. So this is Paul himself being called to salvation. And other people, Ananias said, you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. The verse in question, or under, that we're looking at today, Christ laid hold of me. So Paul sees that Christ laid a hold of him and that for which Christ also but there's two other places. In 1 Corinthians, and we'll show the connection here in a second. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about sharing in its blessings. That is the good news' blessings. So Paul puts himself in there sharing those blessings. And you can read 1 Corinthians 9 uh, to see what I'm talking about here. He also talks about spreading the good news. Finally, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. As we... Paul is including himself here as we stand before our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. Paul is expecting to be there when Christ returns. And then he puts other people there as well. He says, what will be our proud reward and crown when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. And this is what connects these, ver these um, references here. That word prize is only used in Philippians chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 
And then the word crown connects 1 Corinthians chapter 9 with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the prize is the two together, being saved and bringing others with him. And the crown is the other people, meeting heaven with him. Amen. Paul's final point in this part of the letter is to remind us of God's care. And Paul was speaking from his own experience. So I want to focus in a little bit on Paul's story towards the end of his time as Saul the Pharisee. He was zealous for God, as we've already said, and he was pushing hard in the direction that he thought was right. He was persecuting Christians, thinking it was God's will. He started doing this when Stephen was stoned. So Stephen was stoned, and Paul was there, as we can read. And Paul, we, we don't have any evidence that he participated himself in killing Stephen, but he stood there, and we know that he gave his assent. He agreed to what was happening. And then he became a participant in this persecution, and he was relentless in pursuing Christians in Jerusalem. But that wasn't enough for him. He went before the leadership of the Jews, and he asked for a commission and got a letter so that he could go 150 miles away to Damascus to go after the Christians there. And what happened? He was on his way to Damascus, and while he was traveling, a light from heaven flashed around him. He was knocked down along with those who were with him. He was blinded in that moment. And Jesus spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, Paul, and Saul replied, who are you, Lord? He replied, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but stand up and enter the city and you will be told what you must do. And here's the point. Even though Saul the Pharisee was going after Christians, God did not give up on him. And we can think about, when we think about the Pharisees, we, we can think about the people who went after Christ and how hard-hearted they were, and the people who killed Stephen and how hard-hearted they were. And we might discount God's ability to reach those people, but don't do that. God can still save a person, no matter where they are. He did not give up on Paul. God will not give up on us. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this in mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. And there's the point. If you press on in the Christian walk, and if, but if you're, and if you're thinking incorrectly somehow, don't, you don't really need to worry about that. God will reveal even this to you. And I don't think we should fear, let our fears stop us in God's work. Sometimes we might think, I don't know the Bible well enough, so I can't teach anyone else. Or, I don't know enough about God, so how could I possibly share my faith? But we don't, I don't think we have to have those worries. It is far better to keep going and let God work out the details. So Paul's message is simple. Knowing Jesus is priority number one. Keep going forward and leave the past in the past. Take hold of the prize. Try to take hold of it, keep going, try to get to heaven, and try to bring as many of your friends with you as possible. And don't worry along the way. God cares for you, and he cares for me. He will help us in this journey. He never gives up on us. So please, don't give up on God. Amen. If you would stand with me, we're going to sing hymn number 625, Higher Ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand 
my faith on heaven's table and a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has a desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I pray till heaven I found, Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on high.